Yeah. I don't know. Oh, you're kind. You want to? If you get bored, you could. I don't know. You could. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I noticed immediately about uh, Bishop Drew and Elena is uh, how specifically they sought to speak positively about so many churches and ministers and parishioners in this diocese, uh, and how frequently they give you verbal specific encouragement. I, that's really impactful, because it means you're seen and appreciated. And I've got to hear about so many of you and gotten to know you uh, via what they've said. And I think that's really incredible. Uh, I'd like to um, offer a little prayer, and then we'll dive into some material. Would you saturate this time with the Holy Spirit of Christ? Would you accompany yourself to us and help us to really understand how deep our affliction goes and how even deeper your comfort reaches? In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a, a town in western, uh, excuse me, not western Pennsylvania, it's actually in eastern Pennsylvania that has captivated my imagination for years. Several Hollywood movies and video games have been based off this town, including the Silent Hill series, if you're familiar. The town is called Centralia, Centralia, Pennsylvania. It was an old mining town. Uh, it had about 3,000 people in it at one point. During the 1950s, post-World War II era, things were booming, things were going very well. Uh, but they discovered a large treasury of coal underneath a portion of the town and decided to start mining. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, unfortunately, there was an accident in one of the underground mines, and all of a sudden, a fire started in the caves underneath the earth. And they shut that portion of the cave, closed it off, thought, well, uh, we've now suffocated the fire and everything should be fine. Wrong. Uh, what happened is on the surface, they started noticing over the years, why are the streets slowly buckling? And why are the trees all dying? And there's no more grass anymore. That's weird. And why is it that everybody has emphysema? That's strange. And what they realized is that 60 feet underneath the earth, underneath everybody's houses, was this blazing furnace that was killing, slowly killing everything. Now at first, when people started to move away, they thought, how do we handle this so that people are still sold on our town? So they created a remake Centralia campaign in which they planted new grass, new trees, and repaved the roads. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Didn't work, though, uh, because the problem at the core never changed. And so the surface was eventually um, polluted and dried out and toxified yet again. And I want to simply say that that is an image of the human condition and of our attempts to make it look better than it is on the outside, on the surface, but underneath the surface. If you dig deep enough, there are caverns of fire and areas that have yet to receive the Lord's full consolation, comfort, and renewal. And I'd like to address today how to preach or speak to the pained heart, to the core of the people in your congregation, to your friends, and so forth. How do we address the damaged Rocky Horror Picture Show that is the human condition deep down. So I'd like for you, if you would, to please open your Bibles or uh, pull up on your phones, but don't check Amazon or Facebook just yet. Um, open your Bibles and check on your phones uh, to Paul's intro in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. And there are some different translations out there, uh, but uh, I think I'm working from the NIV. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7, and I'm going to read it to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that you share in our sufferings and you will also share in our comfort. Now, two words, of course, that are repeated throughout the text. Affliction and comfort. Affliction and comfort. Now, uh, you may have heard the adage, I think it's too, uh, uh, it's become white noise because it's too often repeated, that the purpose of Christianity is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Have you heard this? Eh, kinda. I mean, I don't know. I think it would be better if the phrase was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the uh, complacent, maybe. But God's ultimate goal for us is to bring us to a place of consolation whereby he gives us life. There are times to challenge people that are stuck and recalcitrant. That's true. But God's ultimate goal is to provide us the consolations of Jesus. And so that's why um, Paul is saying in this passage, God will use affliction in your life, even for the good of other people. But God has also brought us to you so that we can offer you the comfort and not just the comfort, but the comfort with which we have been comforted by God. So I'd just like to give more of a devotional talk to you this time rather than an exegetical one on affliction and comfort, if I might, from a ministerial perspective. Fallenness shoots pain into us like shrapnel from every direction. Metal shards are everywhere in our bodies, hearts, and minds. That's what fallenness does. It is a multifaceted affliction. Uh, the slights and cruelties of this life that make us feel minuscule and forgotten and ruined. Everyone in this room is more vandalized than you think they are. Every one of your friends, every one of your relatives is far more hurt than you can possibly imagine. We are reservoirs of agony running into each other, speaking to each other day after day. Philo of Alexandria, the famous Jewish historian, uh, said famously, be kind for everyone you know is facing a great battle. But if you extend the quote, it's everyone is facing a great battle you know nothing about. Uh, whether it's the parents who misunderstood us, the siblings who mocked us, the pastors who shamed us, the employers who snubbed us, the bullies who beat us, the relatives who abused us, the friends who betrayed us, the mentors who doubted us, or the affections we were denied because it seemed like no one saw us. We're all walking around with a multiplicity of afflictions. It's kind of amazing in some ways that we even get out of bed. At least some seasons of life feel that way. The afflictions that Paul often writes about at least from his perspective and his position as missionary to the Gentiles, are afflictions of a ministerial nature because he was used to rejections and pain. You may remember it's in 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians is a long treatise about uh, Paul's missionary struggles, but uh, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul lists all the things that he suffered. Do you remember that list about being shipwrecked and beaten and rejected? But you know how he ends the list, almost culminates the list with these words? Apart from all these other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all all the churches. Now, for me, sounding shipwreck, like shipwreck sounds a lot worse than anxiety, right, about churches or, or being bitten by snakes or, you know, flogged openly. That sounds a lot worse. But what does Paul say? He culminates this list of stressors with, I'm most worried about the church. I have all of these concerns about the church. And all of you in this room are in Christian ministry of one sort or another, lay or ordained, and don't you know it. The sleepless nights, the twisted stomachs, the muscles that can't relax, the cramped sense, the, the, the worry. Uh, I mean, we all together semi-survived COVID. Do you remember COVID? Yeah, where everyone hated you? 
or at least you thought they did. Like if you're a priest, you know this because you could, you were right. No matter what you did, you were going to make people mad. I remember on one, on the same day, I got two emails. They're just the best. One email was, Ethan, your policies during COVID are so cavalier. You obviously want grandmothers to die. Like they found me out. And on the other hand, I got the same day, Ethan, your uh, COVID policies are so stringent that you're clearly working for the leftist deep state. <laughs> you can't win, right? But people acted out. They didn't know what to do with their anxiety, so they took it out on the priests. And some of us have not recovered from this because people were crazy. And we were crazy. I mean, the world was insane, right? But you know, and that, that, did, a, uh, that did a lot of damage to many churches. Uh, but you know what it is, like, uh, or you know, somebody in your ministry who wants to be your friend, wants to always drive you to the airport when you need a ride, and you're close to them, and they're close to you, and until you do one thing that they do not like, and then you become persona non grata, and they'll do anything to take you down. Uh, or maybe you've risked so much of yourself in a church plant. You poured your heart and your soul into this thing, trying to make it go, trying to make it work. You've prayed and given and fasted and evangelized, and it's just like crumbling before your eyes. Uh, or maybe you were fired from a job without any warning, and now what do you do for money and where are your kids going to, what's going to happen? Where are you going to live? Or maybe you had to fire someone because they were acting out terribly, and that's impossible. I mean, it's really difficult business. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting. I went to um, GAFCON. Some of you were there, which was great. And I was there at the, in the hotel, and I saw a bishop that I happened to know, and he looked so sad, and he was sitting at a table by himself with a little drink and just sort of staring at the wall. And because I knew him and had a previous relationship with him, I, I, I don't know, maybe it was ridiculous, but I wanted to see if he was okay, you know, if, the, if me, the son figure, was seeing if the father figure was okay. So I went over to him, and I sat down, and I said, hey, are you, you all right? I loved his candor. He said, "Not no. And I said, what's up? And he said, it's hard to explain, but when you're retired from this business, people stop calling, and they stop asking about you, and you helped a lot of people, at least you think you did, but then they go away, and you're kind of forgotten, and that's hard. Some of you know what that's like. Uh, my moment came when I faced uh, my um, Hannibal Lecter in the parish. Do you know what that, you know, that maybe some of you have faced a Hannibal Lecter in your parish. All right, somebody who likes to mess with your head, dangerous sorts, malevolent. So uh, I wanted to leave parish ministry three months after I was ordained. <laughs> three months, that's all it took. And I'm dead serious. I, I would have worked at Pizza Hut if I could. I always loved the hut. Um, <laughs> so on my leadership team, there was a, a gentleman, Southern Erudite, uh, had a very high position at the college on our leadership team. I wanted him to be my confidant because he was charming and intelligent and seemed to believe in the plant. But we were having a leadership team meeting. I happened to disagree with uh, a thought that he had had regarding the time of our worship service, and I mentioned, I hear what you're saying, I think this might work a little better. He texted me saying, I need to, come, I need to have you uh, uh, over for lunch. Or, oh, no, we went out to a restaurant. I need you to join me for lunch tomorrow. And I said, great, we're just going to hang out and have a nice time. Oh, no. Now, at that time, I was trying to impress him via personality mirroring, this kind of subconscious tactic we do to mirror the behaviors of other people so they like us. So he ordered catfish, so I ordered catfish. So we're eating our catfish. And he said to me uh, with a wry smile, uh, um, Ethan, I noticed that you publicly disagreed with me in our meeting the other day. I would not advise that in the future. Because we're your primary contributors in this church, and if we go, the money goes, and your church dies. How's your catfish? 
It was like something from a southern gothic novel. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, that story did not have a happy ending either. And we had to remove him from the church and the leadership team. I think it was the first time in his life he'd ever heard the word no. But that, that took more than a pound of my flesh away, at least emotionally speaking. But you have your stories, and you have your scars, and you have your inner caves that are on fire with that, uh, with that centralia toxicity. And uh, what the accuser of the brethren and sistren likes to do is to promote your own remake centralia campaign. Just look fine on the outside. Everything's good. Your ministry's growing. You're happy with your staff. You're good with your money. Your kids are doing well. Everyone's well adjusted. You're psychologically balanced. Everything's equilibrium. And that's not true, probably. <laughs> but, but it sells well, and it creates uh, you know, a, a nice Christmas cards. And, uh, and who doesn't want to believe in that vision of reality, even if it's a pretense and a lie? But this is the real lie, but the satanic lie, make everything look pretty, is you're in public ministry, and it is too risky to admit any weaknesses, because they'll all be exploited and weaponized against you. And there's enough truth in that to make it seem totally true, right? Because some people do do that. They weaponize things, then they try to obliterate you. But uh, um, the same catfish gentleman told me, Ethan, never, ever let anyone see a dent in your armor. Never. Um, <clears throat> now, that idea is a lie from hell. Never let them see weakness. Um, never. Uh, let me say this to you, if you suffer like me, from trying to appear better than you are or more solvent than you are. Um, your weakness, friends, your fragility is your strength, not your damnation. St. Paul knew about this. I mean, he was tough, type A, driven, traveled the world more than Julius Caesar. Tough as nails, right? And yet, has this thorn in the flesh that was unnamed. I like that nobody knows what the thorn in the flesh is really because it universalizes the concept and makes us all relate to it. And all of us have this thing and we agonize over it, we hate it, and we ask God to take it away and God doesn't. And God says to Paul, you're weak. Yeah. You're going to continue to be weak. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. And my grace will radiate because of your weakness. And so your weakness is not um, your damnation. In fact, it's a way to meet Christ. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, those are the afflictions. We live with many personal and ministerial afflictions. And we need comfort. Comfort is not an option. Uh, Paul, strong man Paul, needed comfort. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, needed comfort. Do you remember on the night that he sweats blood, he just wants a little companionship, and everybody's bailing. Comfort is a necessity, not sort of an extra that we occasionally, I mean, some driven people don't think they need it, but they're wrong. Um, remember, strongman Paul wrote also in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 7 about the same theme. When we came into Macedonia, you know, missionaries to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, and we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he has comforted you. Here's St. Paul just needing a friend, a bond, a connection, and God gave it to him. So comfort is not optional. We all seek it and need it. The problem is because sin twists our understanding of self and the world and comfort, we often look for love in all the wrong places, right? We look for comfort in the places that ultimately don't satisfy, whether it's pharmaceutical adventures or binge drinking or a brain full of porn or whatever it is, like we'll find our way to manage, pain management, right? But not all pain management works. Now, it works until it doesn't. I grew up in a family of addicts. My mother died of a drug addiction, uh, of an overdose. Uh, 2020, uh, September 11th. And 
it's a, it's a brutal thing, but addicts are not stupid. Addicts find a way to manage incredible pain within via some source of comfort. And it works for a little while, right? That's why we do it. It takes the edge off for a while. But oh, the payoff. I mean, it's just brutal what it does to them and to others around them. But we do this. We have uh, cheap, false comforts that might have to do with some external source that we take in, or false comforts in what we might believe or say to other people. You know, if you've ever experienced a, a miscarriage, and I pray to God you haven't, but there's probably many women in this room and, who have and many men who have suffered alongside them. Uh, and there are people, well-intentioned, no doubt, who will say some of the dumbest things that could ever be said to another person in the midst of a miscarriage because they're nervous, they're anxious, they want to help, they don't know how, right? And so they say things. Monique heard uh, things, um, uh, things like, well, you'll have other children, or God needed the baby more than you, or... Or you'll, you'll, you're, you're young, you know, more opportunity in the future. Or, or this will be good for your discipleship. <laughs> like even if, even if God in the long run uses pain for somebody's inner restoration later on, don't say it in the moment, right? <laughs> Let that person figure that out 20 years from now. But they, so that's a false kind of comfort. There's also philosophical or framework false comforts um, that seek to uh, um, pacify us. One of my favorites, and at the same time least favorite, is from Archibald, Archibald MacLeish's play from 1958, a Broadway spoken play that was uh, number one on Broadway for three years entitled J.B. Maybe some of you have heard of this. It's a recasting of the story of Job, in which a modern day, well, 1950s modern day, Job is a successful banker living in Gramercy Park in New York City, actually in Manhattan. Um, and uh, he is uh, wealthy, well-married, well-adjusted, has wonderful children. But of course, in the story, Satan enters the scene and things go awry. Job's uh, eldest son is killed by a policeman. When his gun accidentally goes off, his twins are killed and slaughtered by the village idiot, and uh, Job's uh, bank explodes, and his youngest baby is killed by the falling rocks from it. And then he <clears throat> sees all of this in his life entirely devastated in just a few hours. And he looks at his circumstances and chokes out the words, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And his wife, named Sarah in the play, looks at him with ferocity and says, I will not have you offer our innocent children's necks on the altar of your vindictive God. If God is God, then he is not good. And if God is good, then he is not God. Curse God and die. And of course, Job does not curse God, and in the place, Sarah leaves him. Well, Job then gets terribly sick. His friends visit him and make it worse. And then around him, Manhattan burns down in the play. And at the end of the play, Job is sitting in the rubble of his home. And Satan re-enters and sits next to him. All of a sudden, there's a shadow that passes by what used to be his door. And it's Sarah who has come back to Job. And Satan says, invite her in and spit in her face. Remember, Job, the only dignity you have left is your own bitterness. Well, Satan leaves. Job invites her in and says to her, Sarah, you told me to curse God and die, and then you left me. You left me in my pain. And Sarah responds, I left you because I loved you and I could not help you anymore. Because Job, you wanted justice. There isn't any. There's only the world. Cry to heaven for justice and 
the stars will shine until your eyes sting. Weep for your long lost children and snow will fall. Snow will fall upon indifference. There isn't any justice. There's only my love. Blow on the coal of the heart. And then she concludes, the candles in churches are out. The lights have all gone from the sky. But blow on the coal of the heart, and we will see by and by. The wit won't burn, and the wet soul smolders. But blow on the coal of the heart, and then perhaps we will see. Perhaps we will know. And that's the end of the play. I have read the book of Job many times. And each time I am dry-eyed and unmoved. But this play burrows right into my center and makes me think of all the inexplicable hurt in my life and the hurt in other people's lives. And it's hard not to weep then. And he is talented, the author, and he is great. But that ending is just so, so sad. No coming together of strands, no redemption, no ultimate cure for the human condition. The only thing that's left is human affection to blow on the coal of the heart. The problem with that, of course, is that people's hearts glow sometimes with strange fire. There's a new phrase now, love is love. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, at least in concept. I know plenty of fentanyl addicts that love fentanyl. Human hearts burn with very strange affections. More than that, even if they don't, human hearts die. We need something stronger than blowing on the temporary coal of the heart. That ending is Christless. It is gospelless. It is hopeless. And so we need a better comfort. Paul is not saying you just need comfort. He's like a good pastor. He qualifies the comfort. This is what he says. The Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's a transcendent comfort, not a pharmaceutical comfort. It's a transcendent comfort that comes from God through other people to us. But it has something of eternality in it, of heaven in it, of the gospel in it. It is resourced in God himself, not in our fanciful ideas or speculations uh, or anything else. We need a transcendent comfort. And it's mediated in this passage through people. Paul is comforting others. Others are comforting Paul. Um, we need people in this ministry. We are a fellowship of suffering. That's Paul's language. We are, have bonds together because of our pain uh, to bring each other the transcendent comfort of the gospel. Because my brain leaks this data, and yours does too. That's why I need you and you need me, because I'm not always strong, and neither are you, and I'm not always dying on the vine, and neither are you. But isn't it interesting, in marriage sometimes you'll find this, when you're just at your wit's end and going crazy, your spouse, who might sometimes be, you know, teetering, becomes super strong for you, and pulls you through, and vice versa? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, this brand of comfort, the comfort that doesn't die, is all about what Jesus has accomplished and others that can reflect that to us. And I had that occur for me I, I, um, a few years ago. I, I mentioned how my mother passed away. But this is a story about my dad. So she died on September the 11th, and she and my dad divorced when I was 12, and it was not good. Uh, but they semi-patched things up. They both remarried other people, and they became amicable and could spend time around each other without, uh, without freaking out. Well, when my mother died, I was invited, or um, it was demanded that I do the funeral service and preach. That was one of the hardest services I'd ever done. And I kept it together, you know. I was able, except at the end. There was the committal at the graveyard, 
And it was one of those old-fashioned funerals where they wanted to lower the casket uh, during the, the end of the, ser- the service, the liturgy. And so I was there with an intimate group of, of my, really just my family, no friends at that point, just my family, including my father, so my mother's ex-husband. And I was supposed to throw the dirt and then read the Cranmer words, right? You may rem- remember those finalizing words. <laughs> um, that, we, that talks about our sure and certain hope of the resurrection to our eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our sister, Kimberly, and we commit her body to the ground. And then it carries on. But I couldn't do it. For whatever reason, I was cool. Before that point, I was fine. And then when the casket was lowering, as I said those words, I couldn't finish the prayer. It was right in front of me. It's in the book. I just had to read it. But it's like the law slapped me right in the mouth. And I'm like, oh, this is it. We never got to patch things up, she and I. We didn't fix our relationship. We, she died of an overdose. This is the end. And it's not a good ending. And I couldn't say it. I was sitting, standing there with the book, and I can't read the book. I was stuck in time. But then a mini miracle happened. My dad, Jack Magnus. Let's just say he's not touchy-feely. He's a steel worker from Pittsburgh (laughs) who is kind of emotionally made of wood. (laughs) I've never heard him say I love you. He's never given me a hug. He's not that guy. But that day, I'm standing by myself, and all of a sudden, after probably 45 seconds of saying nothing, he takes his hand and lays it on my shoulder and keeps it there. And for whatever reason, I came to. And then I could finish the prayer and release the situation and release her in, into God's hands. And I thought about that event a lot because I could say earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and I thought, why could I say it then? It's because my dad, in a small way, was an icon of Jesus who walks toward the pain and puts his hand on you when you're in your own hell and cares for you, not when you fix it, but when you can't fix it, when it's too hard. Um, there's a song by Iris Dement. The, uh, if you've seen the new version of True Grit, she's in the soundtrack. It's really good. And she sings a song about Jesus, and she's an agnostic, but this is what she sings about Jesus. He reached down, he reached down, got right there on the ground. He reached down and touched the pain. And that's what he does. He is like a heat-seeking missile for affliction because he knows all about it from personal experience. Remember Isaiah 53? He was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. That in our affliction, the afflicted God meets us, enters in, and shows us new depths of redeeming love. God is not afraid of our centralia. He already knows all about it. The all-seeing eyes already perceive it. And he is ill-content to stay on the surface level, but he rushes into the caves that are on fire. And he alone can soothe and cool the underground blazes through the proclamation of the gospel a radical absolution and people that mirror that to us, whether it's a priest, a therapist, a friend, whomever, that can bring the grace of God closer, make it tangible, and that can reshape us. You know, it's interesting. Um, Luther uh, once said, if you really want to know if you're growing in the Christian life, don't ask yourself because you're a bad judge of that. Um, he thinks mo- he's convinced most people hate themselves, and so he, he thinks you won't see any growth. Ask somebody who loves you, and they'll tell you. So I asked Monique. I risked it. I asked my wife, and she's Italian, so she always tells me what she thinks. I said, like, where am I developing? Where am I evolving? Where am I growing in Jesus? And she said, well, here's the thing. You have always been an anxious mess, and you're still 
feel anxious all the time. She said, that said, that said, um, your anxiety doesn't last long now. It used to last for days and days, you know? Like when I was really upset, I couldn't eat. I would, I would throw my sleep off. It would be terrible. And I would obsess and catastrophize. She's like, now you catastrophize for an hour. But an hour's better than eight days. I'm like, yeah, yeah, an hour is better than eight days. Right? And that's not nothing. I'll take 90% healing. Like, good enough. Um, someday we'll all get 100%, but until then, 90 is okay, right? That's all right. Yeah. So it's been beautiful um, that how Jesus has helped me. Because what I've realized is, over time, that there's nothing in me that he is afraid of, and nothing in me that is so broken that it can't be partially mended. More can be mended than you fear, and more can be mended than you know. Yeah. Um, I can say with the character Estella from Great Expectations, at the end of the novel, I have been bent and broken, but I hope into a better shape. Now, sermonically, in terms of sermons, what are some tips in terms of reaching the heart, offering true comfort with which we have been comforted? How do we do that? beneath the surface where we pretend. How do we offer real comfort? I have five things that'll take me two minutes to, to say. First, a good anthropology. Always assume your hearers are two days away from a nervous breakdown, because many of them are. In the wrong situation, the wrong circumstances, the wrong triggers, you don't know what could happen. Just assume people are far more damaged than you think they are, and self-sabotaging. Point two, self-awareness. Know your own pain story. Uh, here's a little tip that I learned from a Lutheran. Preach from your scar tissue, not your open wounds. You have more authority when you speak from the places that God has healed up, not the places that are icky and gross. Like, give that some time. <laughs> Invite Jesus into those places, but maybe put a pause on that because it gets messy and weird. Yeah? Three, use illustrations that connect to the deep tissue of life. Not, and many, nobody here would do this, but I've heard it in other churches. Please don't use cheesy stories from email forwards about kittens or bunnies. Um, they don't relate to real people because nobody cares about those things. Um, so real illustrations. Four, again, end your sermon with good news. If there's challenge to offer in the sermon, it's fine. But put it in the middle of the sermon. Give good news, a one-way gift of God in every sermon. Give it the last word so that people know that even if they fail, Jesus still has them. And fifth, uh, gospel-centered preaching is an art that needs to be honed. And if you're not good at it, who cares? Seek out somebody who is and listen to their stuff and take the best of it. That's not copywriting. It's Christian copycatting. That's different. Now, you can't claim their stories as your own, like, this happened to me when it didn't. Um, but instead, uh, St. Paul believes very clearly in an imitation ethic. He says sometimes, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. I'm glad he qualified it instead of just saying imitate me, because sometimes, you know, Paul's complicated. But as he imitates Jesus, as he embodies something of Jesus, and you find that heartwarming and good, it's probably best to do some personality mirroring. And sometimes we learn through imitation. It's fine. Uh, so that's something about affliction, something about comfort, something about preaching. And now let me close uh, with a beautiful example of true Christic comfort for the afflicted. And this comes, I'm going to need your help singing it, okay? So this comes from a 1991 hit by a musician named Mark Cohn entitled Walking in Memphis. Anybody know it? Yeah? Oh, thank God. Okay, good. So it has this beautiful backstory. Maybe you know it, that Mark Cohn in the 19, late 80s and 90s, early 90s, was very depressed, and he felt artistically stuck and uninspired, like the muse had stopped speaking. And so we had a friend say, one, one thing that can bring you back into the stream of life is to go to a destination in which you know no one, and then you can... Um, be, begin to be creative in this new space. And he thought, well, okay, I'll go to Memphis. I've always wanted to, and I've never been there. So uh, walking in Memphis is based off an experience he had there at Al Green's church. It was this black Pentecostal church in Memphis. And so Mark Cohn writes this, walking in Memphis is 100% autobiographical. The moment I wrote it, I had no idea I was writing a hit song. 
but I knew I was writing something that deeply defined many, fats, many facets of me. Because of this song, people often think that I'm a Christian. And in a way, I like that. He's Jewish, by the way. Uh, at the center of the song is a woman named Muriel, who was this little-known African-American uh, nightclub singer. And maybe you can help me with do you know some of the lyrics? Maybe some of you do. So I'm going to try it. Muriel plays the piano every Friday at the Hollywood. And they brought me down to see her. And they asked me if I would do a little number. So I sang with all my might. And she said, tell me, are you a Christian child? And I said, ma'am, I am tonight. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to walk up that altar call, you know? I mean, it's so good. Well, this is his reflection. Muriel ended up changing my life, not only as a musician, but as a person. I talked to her for hours in a dilapidated bar. She let me talk and talk about how sad I was, mostly about my parents who had died when I was very young. She saw things in me and shared things with me, things I don't normally talk about. It must have been about 2 a.m., and she had invited me up to sing with her in the bar, me and this lovely lady that I'd never meet again. And then at the end of our final song, as the applause was rising up over the crowd, she leans over and whispers in my ear, you got to let go of your pain, child. Your mother and dad didn't mean to leave you and die. They're with God now. They're where they have to be. And you're where you have to be. It'll be all right, because Jesus makes everything all right. Yeah. Well, there was God, from one person to another, offering the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted, comforting this orphaned artist who was emptied, but then listened and was filled up. Well, Memphis in the song is a symbol, a symbol of the place in which God comes close, not to hit you or abuse you, but to give you the comfort that you really need. Jesus has entered into our places of affliction and will continue to do so because of his dogged persistence, cave by cave until you are all healed up. He comes to transform your centralia into a Memphis. And we've all got a prayer in Memphis. Thank you.